Available now at crimecon.co.uk are gift baskets for your loved ones this Christmas who have an interest in true crime. If you're looking for the perfect gift for listeners of this show or of similar shows, you can get your tickets today with early bird discounts and payment plans, along with a special 10% discount by using the exclusive code COLT at the checkout. If you are listening from overseas and you are interested in attending the event, we have our very own travel agent who will hold your hand through the entire booking, travelling and coordinating of flights, transfers and hotels, especially if you are travelling alone. And of course, once you land at the event, I will be there. I know some of you already have your tickets and I can't wait to see you in June 2023 in London at the UK CrimeCon. Visit crimecon.co.uk to get your tickets today. And now on to the show. Hello listeners and welcome to part two of this mini-series on The Work, a group led by Brother Julius. This is Lisa's story and in part one, Lisa talked us through how her mother became involved in The Work when Lisa was only young. Part two will explore Lisa's life growing up in The Work. For full-length, ad-free and early access to these interviews for only £1 or $1.50 a month, you can sign up and support the show at patreon.com forward slash the cult vault. Now, here is Lisa. So you you really are at one of those big crossroad transitional periods in your life at that age. And you, when you're told that you cannot go in the direction you want to, does that force your hand into just saying, OK, well, then I'll throw myself fully into the work and Brother Julius's teachings? It was never a conscious decision. It was it, it was a de facto decision. Uh, I mean, another reason I couldn't even finish my senior year in high school is because my mother got remarried and moved us. I'm all over the place here, but my brother was 18 when he got married the first time. And he actually married one of Julius's stepdaughters. He was out of the house and already having his first child. And I was there living with just my mother. And she met this other man, sort of upper echelon in the cult, and moved myself and her to live with him in another town and I remember thinking well how am I going to get to school and it was like well it doesn't matter so at 17 I started um well actually at 17 I left the house because I didn't get along with him at all at all and I started working for the cult companies and that was what you did you went to meetings I won't even call them bible meetings because I feel like it it you know it's, it's not right to I mean, okay, he used the Bible, but I have a different relationship with the Bible now, finally. And so I don't even like putting it in the same sentence. I'll just say meetings. And that's how they were referred to then anyway. Um, I worked and worked and worked and tithed. We gave, we had to give at least 20% of our money to Julius. And, um, you know, I worked and went to meetings. Was it typical for people as young as 17 to start working within these companies? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. As soon as you were of legal age to work, which I guess around here is, is 16, 15, if you have what they call working papers. And I worked, you know, as a receptionist, as I said, and um, I worked for a lot of the companies, but primarily at a hot dog place called Frankie's. The, the wages that you were paid and the hours that you worked, would have would those have fallen under regulation? Probably not. We weren't allowed to complain about anything. As a matter of fact, some of us didn't get paid anything. I, I remember being pregnant and, and doing what they call um, pre-construction cleaning of all the homes that were going up and being exposed to chemicals and and not being paid. And I remember doing a lot of babysitting and house cleaning and working at daycares and not being paid. Um, putting in work orders and you know occasionally you, you get paid but it was it was always just up to Julius his wife Joanne who called herself the Holy Spirit and Paul Sweetman who was the businessman uh, the money man behind the scenes of everything and you were expected to tie the percentage of, of everything that you were earning on top of not being paid that much for working long hours oh absolutely I mean, there was never any money. I mean, there was money for for Julius to have his own private driver and to uh, and for his wife and Paul Sweetman to live in a big house in a gated community and for their children to go to private school and everything. But we were eating blocks of what we call government cheese here. And um, 
and I just remember, you know, being married again, I'm skipping ahead. I was about 21 and my then husband being like a foreman on the construction team and making like $300 a week to, to raise a family and to pay his child support from his first wife, whom he was told to leave, even though there was a newborn child. You know, that's another thing about this cult was that if you came in and you were already married or had children, if those people didn't come in with you, you were told to leave them. So there was, there was a lot of angst and heartache and lawsuits. And I remember the men being told, you don't have to pay child support. If I can use the word whore, you know, if you were a woman of the world, you were a whore and you were told to not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. And, you know, there were these, you, you were just, you were just excised. You were, you were like surgically removed from, from what you knew because people were coming in and, and leaving their families. And so, yeah, I mean, back to the money. Um, I think some people made more, the people that were in the real estate agency during its heyday definitely were going on vacations and having the nicer homes and people like me were cleaning their homes for maybe $20 if I was lucky. I, you know, I worked at a lot of daycares within the cult because there was always a lot of children. You know, there, there was uh, Sunday school for the children who were too young to go to meetings. Th I think we started going to meetings at around 12. It was a very big deal in adolescence to be allowed to go to the meetings. And I mean, that's another whole thing. My memories of those meetings and just how traumatic, loud, scary. I was going to ask you if you could talk us through what you remember of those meetings from the ages of sort of 17 to 21, where things started to change, um, become a bit more nefarious than perhaps they were when you were a bit younger. Well, I mean, being that the main message of the group was that the world was going to end and that we had to be at the top of our game, you know, we had to always be obedient. Uh, you weren't allowed to have any doubt or question him. And it was just, he was up on a stage behind a podium with a microphone yelling and sort of slamming on his Bible and doing what he would call demonstrations in the spirit. You know, there was a lot of speaking in tongues and shaking in the spirit. And he would bring people on the stage to read each other's auras. And he would sort of pit people against each other. You know, you're spiritual and you're not, um, you know, you tell this one what's wrong with them and what their deficits are. And, and then would have like Bible assignments and would, these meetings lasted for hours. You know, a typical meeting, on a Sunday would be like eight to 12 hours. And then there'd be nighttime meetings that would be about three to four hours. And, and I remember being a child laying on the floor, you know, cause I, well, I was like six at my first meeting because my mother would just bring us when my, you know, my father was working or whatever and uh, laying on the dusty floor with her lumpy purse under my head as a pillow and just hearing this reverberating yelling I mean, kids can sleep through anything, but, but that was this template, you know, of my life. And so, yeah, the meetings, you know, the meetings were sometimes gentle. He would sometimes play music and, and make us feel very much part of the fold. And we were his special angels and, you know, would be singing and sort of bouncing around in the spirit and he would shake a tambourine. And, you know, there were times when you were very happy to be part of something that you thought was good. And, you know, but then it would, it would shift in mood and he would have a meeting all about the persecution that was coming and you better get used to, you know, rapists out there and people that are going to try to murder you and you're going to be tortured and you better not, you know, get, you better not um, deny me because you'll be tortured by them and just horrifying you know if he wasn't pleased with you and you were cast out if you were rejected by God. It was a very big deal and there was a lot of crying and people just dejectedly going back to their seat and gathering up their things and walking out and people crying and begging him to stay and i mean there was even a suicide that happened because people would leave and get depressed because well if you're being rejected by almighty god what do you do you're, you're cast into the wilderness 
And that's how you truly felt inside. So there was a shunning process that came with being kicked out by Brother Julius? Absolutely. If you if you were on the street and you ran into an ex-follower or someone who either fell away on their own, if somebody left the work, it was a really huge deal. You had to like cross the street if you saw them. But if somebody was kicked out by Julius, um, you also had to either pray for them or just be glad it wasn't you or realize they must be very evil to have displeased him. So yeah, you were definitely shunned. And I know when I left, I had no one, literally no one but my daughter. I'm not surprised you were in a perpetual state of nervousness. It sounds like you never know what what Brother Julius you're going to get at any of these meetings. Oh, I suffer from anxiety to this day. <laughs> some call it brain chemistry and uh, some call it a product of severe complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And you mentioned that there were echelons or, or tiers that were established within this group. Could you talk us through what, what those look like and how many people there might be from one tier to the next? So there was like group A, B, C, and D. If you were in group D, you were what was known as a baggage keeper, meaning when the judgment was going to come and it was going to be almost like this war or a battle you were just going to stay behind with whatever was left, you know, and C was like a little better than that. B meant, you know, you could move up into A. A meant you were, you were Julius's favorites for whatever reason. You, um, you did his bidding more, or you were one of the women he wanted to sleep with, or you were one of the high earners that would give him a lot of money. And it kept you very unstable emotionally and very questioning of yourself. And I can do better. I can do better. I can do better. There was just a lot of humiliation, not feeling good about yourself at all. You know, it, when, when he would come to someone's house for dinner, I just remember being so nervous one time when he came to our house for dinner after my father died and just, we had to clean the house for like three days and everything had to be perfect. My mother made a meal of only the the foods he liked and served the kind of wine he liked. And and I remember actually trembling because he, he had a presence about him. You know, you can see on the, the YouTube videos or the documentary what he was like with the loud voice and the piercing stare. I just remember always being afraid unless you were in good favor. You know, one time he approached me after a meeting. I was probably a teenager. Well, it, it was before I got married. I kind of see things in terms of pre-marriage at 21. And then, you know, well, even after you're married, you weren't safe from Julius's advances. But one of the only times he came to me personally was after a meeting. And I remember the foyer was just very crowded and very hot. It, it was It was always just very hot in the summer and very cold in the winter. And we were crowded in like sardines. It probably wasn't even legal by fire codes to have that many people in one place. But he approached me and I, you know, again, the internal trembling and he got up very close to my face and he looked me up and down and he said, I'll never forget the actual words. He said, you know, you're becoming a very beautiful woman. And then he, he paused and he says, of God, you know, so there's the dis disclaimer. And then he leans in even closer. And I remember his, his breath on my face and he says, have you felt the Holy Spirit yet? And I said, I don't think so, Lord, or no, Lord. And he said, do you want to feel it where it counts? That was a disgusting sexual proposition. And I didn't fully realize a lot of secrets were kept from us. Or I was just in the dark all the time with my nose in a book. But there was a work going on called the special work within the work where he was finding, he was sleeping with other people's wives and he was propositioning young girls. And there was child sexual abuse that went on. And, you know, he would, he would get men to give their wives to him. And he had a special work of seven women that he called his wives and concubines. So if he chose you, you weren't to say no. And I'm just very lucky that it never came to that with me. It, it didn't, like, I'm, I'm so fortunate that I never capitulated to that and that it wasn't part of my, quote, calling, you know, special work. Uh, and 
I don't know if these women enjoyed his company or not, but it was supposed to be this huge blessing if he chose you, you know, you had favor bestowed upon you if he wanted you in that way. And, you know, he, he said it was how, you know, God conveyed his spirit into another person. And it was a special way of God showing love. And he was just a perverted old man, which of course I can say now, but it, it was a mind twist for sure. Before we hit the record button, we were actually talking about what Brother Julius looks like. And I feel like that might be quite a prevalent thing to talk about now when we're discussing the fact that he was imposing or enforcing or putting himself onto all of these various women, including at one point, almost yourself. What, what height was Brother Julius, roughly? Not tall. I would say probably five, six, maybe. Which is really interesting that you say that, because when I looked at a picture of Brother Julius... I had to do a double take because I was like, that's not Brother Julius, that's Charles Manson. And actually, it was a picture of Brother Julius who just looks strikingly in some pictures like Charles Manson, who also happened to be five foot six. Yeah, well, you know, Julius um, always wore a beard. All the men in the cult had to wear beards and the women had to have long hair, no makeup. We couldn't wear black a lot of rules like that but um he had like piercing blue green eyes a very deep voice he was really known for for a deep voice i mean you knew when he walked in a room and of course when he walked in a room everybody had to stand up and then we it got to a point where we had to bow and curtsy in front of him you know he was always pushing the envelope you know every couple of years or so or maybe even months something would happen that he would call a new dispensation and he would get up on the podium and he would say, God, the father showed me this. So now we're going to start doing this. And here's a new rule. And from now on, you men can strike your wives if they displease you. And yeah, it, corporal punishment was very big, very big in that group. I saw a lot of children being abused and I saw adults being abused because there was one uh, public meeting where he he physically abused, you know, with belts, um, people that displeased him. And he said it was a demonstration of God being an angry father and we're disobedient children. And again, it was meant to, to strike fear into our hearts and to humiliate people. These cults are ruled by fear. kind of had a feeling that brother Julius's intentions towards you as a young female might have been a bit dodgy when he gave you the names abundance affection because that almost suggests that you're supposed to be somebody that gives a lot of affection does he mean to him I think he would just name you according to your personality or what he wanted you to be I'm not really sure where those names came from um, and, you know, of course, we were told it was from the heart and mind of God. And I, 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 that's a good question that I can't really answer, because, again, it just became part of my normal living to, to stop calling somebody, say, Janie, and now you're calling her good attitude or righteousness or willingness. Everyone had a nest name so that you could live up to. So I guess I was supposed to have an abundant heart. I was supposed to be affectionate which I already was, it wasn't like something to overcome. But, you know, I had a pretty docile personality and I think he just preyed upon it. I think he, you know, like all wolves kind of, you know, <laughs> case the field and, and, and know which ones, I mean, not, not that I was weak, but, you know, people have different personality types and he wanted to keep the women very subjugated and very submissive and very, you know, the men is the, the head of the household and, you know, it was very old fashioned in the sense that it was, you know, the, the father and the mother and then the children and everyone had to obey. And um, but the men had to fall under Julius. And I'll never forget that when Julius came into his, quote, dispensation, where he was going to ask men for their wives, it I remember that meeting and what it was like to see these men's faces and to realize that they were now in a real quandary of their protectiveness toward their wives and their loyalty and of course the women didn't want to sleep with him in my opinion 
it would be horrific. Um, but but I remember Julius just yelling and saying, you know, you, you won't say no to me. This is a test of your faith. This is your ultimate test. I realize what I'm asking of you. And it's not because I'm a sexual predator. This is God telling me to do this because in that day, seven women shall lay hold upon one man. You know, that's, I think, from Revelations. Uh, you know, the end of the world's going to come and there's going to be more women than men. And he just wanted to sleep around and use your holy text and his own twisted interpretations in order to justify that. That's the worst part of all of this in my hindsight as a woman of my age right now. When I look back on it, I mean, if that's your belief system, that it's a holy book, you look at something as fundamental as someone's faith, you know, something as unassailable as someone's, especially as a child you know, you, 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 you're soul raping someone, if I can yep. say that, I, you know, when people ask me to summarize my childhood, I just say that I was hijacked. I was hijacked. I was um, more than just my plans were thwarted. I mean, my whole life was just set on this course that had nothing to do with me. You know, normal children are encouraged to be educated, have a job, have a family and be a productive member of society and be a good person. And I was taught that the whole world is going to hell for the most part, unless we can convert them and everyone's wrong except us. And, but of course, even within the confines of the cult, there were, there was dissension, there were schisms, there were, there were subgroups, you know, like he would, he would have these meetings based on your uh, zodiacal sign, your, the zodiac sign. Um, there would be women's meetings, there would be men's meetings there would be young people's meetings, you know, there were weird meetings uh, based on how to please your man or how to be a better husband or how to be a more obedient child. And, you know, it was a, I know I keep using the word barrage, but your brain was just constantly banged into with do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. You better do this better. There was no chance to rest. There was no chance to say, well, what do I want to do? What do I even like to do? What do I like to eat? What do I want to wear? What, what, what would I look for in a mate? And if you did still feel those feelings, which I did, because I think I retained enough individuality to even make it you know, possible for my escape, you were supposed to cast out those spirits. You were supposed to believe that your, your internal being was riddled with evil spirits that you were just always endeavoring to cast out. So therefore, like, when I was a teenager and I would look at a boy because that's a normal thing to do. Oh, that's the spirit of lust. Oh, I, I have to stay pure until I'm married. You know, you, you just weren't supposed to, oh, I can't listen to that music because, you know, it, it'll say something about sex in it. Or, you know, I, I, I can't eat that cereal because it's called Lucky Charms. And, and he, there, were, there were some strange things like as a child, I mean, of course, there was no regular Christmas or, God forbid, Halloween. We had to stay home from school that day. But um, we couldn't watch, like, Bed Knobs and Broomsticks, the, you know, that that movie for a kid. There was a show on TV called Bewitched. Anything that had to do with the occult or witches or leprechauns, uh, that was very much frowned upon, you know, a, a lot of rules like that. So when you are partnered with your would-be husband at around the age of 21, have you seen him before? Do you know what he looks like? Are you aware of who he is? Have you had any conversations? What does that pairing look like? And how do you react when you are told by Brother Julius that he believes that you are a spiritual pair and so you shall be married? Well, I remember being around that age and, and kind of having crushes on different people that were available and single within the work. Um, and you were supposed to always consult with him. You had to ask permission for everything. And so I remember going up to him and saying, I like so-and-so. And he would say, absolutely not. Unequivocally, no. He, he would say, you'll know when he comes along. Somebody came into the group and it was always very exciting when someone new would show up. I, I remember very viscerally that excitement of sort of fresh blood in the group, you know, um, and, and making them feel welcome and like, oh, you know, we have a new angel among us. 
And anyway, this man came in um, through his brother and um, he lived with my brother because my brother by then had been separated. And as a matter of fact, he lived in a house with a couple of different single men or men that were divorced. And I went over there one day with like a casserole, I think for my brother. And I met this man and I thought, well, he's attractive. And, and we kind of were attracted to each other. And we kind of surreptitiously started dating. But then Julius got wind of it. And we had to like meet before him. And he said, do you two want to start dating? You know, you need my blessing first and you're not to sleep with each other. So we were dating. And now bear in mind, I was 21 and a virgin. My then husband was 28 and I was already going to be his third wife. He was already married twice before and had a child. So we wanted to start dating, but we weren't supposed to sleep together. So, you know, you had to arrange like a quick marriage, which we had in somebody's house and he was there. And we got married and went to Cape Cod for a short honeymoon in the middle of winter. And there's not much to do on Cape Cod in the middle of winter because everything's closed and it's cold. So we conceived a child and came home. And uh, I, I mean, I literally had her nine months and 10 days after I got married. And after, I don't know how intimate we should get in a podcast, but whatever. <laughs> Um, it was like the first time I ever had sex and I got pregnant. So I tell people it can happen. Be careful. But she's a huge blessing in my life. I mean, no regrets about that whatsoever. I mean, that's, that's the cream that came out of all of this, but that's kind of a whole other chapter now that we're going into it. I don't want to be ahead of your questions. But... No, nope, that we, I feel like we're exactly in, in the story where we're supposed to be. Um, I was actually going to ask you if, you were comfortable to talk about it being married to somebody who has experience with sex who has an understanding of anatomy and how things work I mean where was your sex education at that point so you had you had absolutely no idea what to expect in terms of sexual intercourse my mother never even had like the talk with me uh, you know um I I knew nothing. I had never seen a man's parts up close, just nothing. So when I went away with him, I remember getting very drunk on champagne because I was just so nervous and, and him kind of telling me like, well, here's what we're going to do. Like, like, this is what you do. Not, I mean, not, not that he was rough or cruel or anything, but it's, it's what you do, I guess, when you get married. And, you know, the funny thing about it was during the, the wedding, which was not, traditional but I mean it was a legal wedding um I remember like staying there and drinking champagne and and my friends saying don't you want to leave don't you want to leave with him like aren't you excited to go and be with him and I, I and I said no because I was scared because I knew it wasn't that I had no desires but I just I didn't, I didn't know anything you know so uh yeah he definitely knew more than me but we we weren't really on the same plane in that way. Um, but you had to say yes, as a wife, you know, you couldn't, it was sort of your duty. Um, but I was happy to be busy raising a child. I kind of had this whole new dedication in my life. Once I became a mother, even though I was still within the construct of the cult, I still felt very protective of her and, but you, but your children weren't really your own. I mean, they were, but they weren't because everybody was just born into this group and we weren't even allowed to name our children. They had to go to Sunday school and they, you know, we had to teach them from the Bible and we had to punish them a lot and keep them in line. And I, I was already at that point starting to pull away because I just, something ferocious and protective comes up. Well, at least in me, I didn't see it in all of the women. Like I said, when I would see other females, I'm not even gonna say spank, I'm gonna say beat their children. That left a mark on my mind. Like I really have to push it out of my mind at times because um, it was just so abusive. And, and, and to twist the Bible around to you know, the whole spare the rod and spoil the child and raise up a child in the way they shall go. And when they're old, they will not depart from thee. What about love? Like, like, what about the parts of the Bible about being 
a person your child loves and trusts. Everything was fear. And I was not about to raise my child with that. I, um, it wasn't like that with me or, or really even my husband, who was a pretty gentle man. And he, he was very hardworking within the cult. He worked in construction. And um, I mean, we weren't unhappy, but we would not have chosen each other personality wise. And he was brand new to the cult. Now I had already been in it since I was five, fully indoctrinated and immersed. And he was just kind of experimenting and exploring, but then all of a sudden he's in it. And then he's not, I'll say James, that's not his real name. He's not James anymore. He's accessibleness. That's his word, accessibleness. And he goes into business on his own later on with his brother, construction. And life went on. I mean, relatively normal meetings and getting ready for the end of the world and waiting for the next, you know, command or demand from Julius. And my just trying to be a good mom and a good wife and keep the house clean and keep the the foods cooked that my husband liked and and again not to belabor the point but just meetings the the cornerstone of this cult was going to i think sometimes there was like a meeting every night and you had to check in like if you didn't go to a meeting you got a phone call and also if you forgot to tithe you got a phone call where's your envelope you know so that's what it was about, was getting people to obey, give you money, give you devotion, don't ask questions, realize your place. And if he calls you to be with him, to not say no. And I mean, not to oversimplify this level of mind control, but if I look back on it and break it up into chunks, that's what was going on, was financial greed, sexual depravity, and raising your children in fear, you know, and getting ready to, for the end of the world, which of course never happened. And he would like, like most cult leaders, he would, he would come up with dates or times we're getting ready. You know, we're getting ready to go out into the world. You know, we're going to go into the church. It, well, actually that did happen. He, he sent us into churches to cause trouble and to sit in the back and, you know, you're teaching these people the wrong things. And, which is funny, not funny, but when you think about it, I mean, they were mainstream and they were doing the right things. And we're the crazies in the back row yelling at them that they were out of God's will. That is the end of part two of this mini series. For full length interviews ad free with early access, you can support the show at patreon.com forward slash the cult vault. If you'd like to get in touch, you can find me at cult vault podcast at gmail.com or follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Cult Vault Pod. I'm your speaker, Casey, host of the Cult Vault Podcast.